to open up in a word of prayer. We're going to pray for merit, and then we'll go ahead and dive right into the text here this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Hmm. Lord Jesus, I thank you this morning, Lord, for your presence. Lord, and I thank you. Your word tells us that in this world, we will have tribulation. But Jesus, you looked your disciples in the eyes and you said, but be of good courage. I have overcome the world. Lord, this morning, I pray as we look at your word, Holy Spirit, as you're here amongst us, moving around us, Lord, desiring to minister to us, God, I pray that we would realize, Lord, you have overcome this world. As John the Apostle said, greater is he who's in us than he who is in this world. And Father, we pray today, Lord, bring that about, that revelation to each one of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter 3, we're going to be in this morning, 1 Samuel chapter 3, and we're going to really look at 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 10. A um, little bit of housekeeping. Up here on the front, you'll see a table with some books on it. Um, we're going to be looking at, as a church, 1 Samuel chapter 3. I've got some of these. If you want to study the book more in depth, they're here for you. You know, just, you can have it for free or pay the amount on the back. We'll have more of those. But as a church, over the next couple months, we're going to look at 1 Samuel. Wednesday night, we're going verse by verse right through the chapter. And each Sunday, we're going to take one of those verses and really look to apply it to our lives. This morning, we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 10. And if you're taking note, the title to the message is Hearing God's Voice. Hearing God's Voice. Uh, I want to give you a picture of the world today. And I know sometimes... You guys might get a little afraid when I do this, but I'm just going to read some of the headlines from this past week. The Senate is poised to confirm Judge Kavanaugh for the Supreme Court. Another headline, one condemned inmate kills another in rare death row, death row slaying at San Quentin Prison. Banks brace for the downside of higher rates. This is another headline. I think this was from the Wall Street Journal. Many Catholics struggling to keep the faith. The next headline, where the earth became a river, Indonesia quake liquefied the crown. Next headline, the Interbol chief goes missing in China. <laughs> That's interesting. Next headline, swarms of supersized mosquitoes swarm North Carolina. Did you guys read about that? These giant mosquitoes swarming the people. This morning, we're going to look at hearing God's voice. And I want to say this to you, the voice of God, the voice of Jesus, the words of Jesus come cutting through the culture to you and I every single day. We're going to look at that today. The idea, and I want to ask you a question, does God still speak today? Do you believe that God still wants to speak today? Does God want to lead you in your life, in the little things, and in the big decisions of your life. We're going to look this morning. Well, how does God speak, right? <laughs> if he wants to, how does he do this? And the next question I have is, why does skepticism or cynicism arise when we talk about hearing God's voice? The, I almost said the National Enquirer, but National Geographic had a uh, article, this, uh, one of their, their reporters wrote about five men that he personally met and went out and found who all think that they are the Messiah. The Messiah. The first man, his name was Moses Halongwain. He's also known as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. They also call him Jesus. His location is Eshui, South Africa, and this man, Moses Halongwain, preaches to his flock during his own wedding ceremony, an event he says marks the beginning of the end of days. Moses says that God identified him as the Messiah during a dream in 1992. Listen, if you are here and you think you're the Messiah, please let us know before you talk to anyone else. 1992, he found this out. Another man that identifies himself as the Messiah, his name is Viserion. He's also known as the Christ of Siberia. Uh, in an off-the-grid Russian village called Obatel Rasveta, 
Uh, Viserion sits in the living room of a disciple. Born Sergei Torop, he had a revelation around the time the Soviet Union collapsed that he was Jesus Christ reborn. Founder of the Church of the Last Testament, Testament he now has at least 5,000 followers. Many of them live with him in several utopian eco-villages in the Siberian woods. They're built their own schools, churches, and society. And Viserion's proclamations have been published in 16 uh, different titles, and he calls them the Last Testament. So if you have a book with you right now called The Last Testament by Viserion, you're in trouble. The next man, Jesus of Kitwe, he's also known as the original rock of the world, Mr. Faithful or Mr. Word of God. His name is Bupete Chibwe. You're going, Pastor, are we going to study the Bible? Just stay with me. You'll catch this. Chibwe Chisimba sits on a sofa in his home in Kitwe, Zambia. This disciple goes by several names, but his disciples refer to him simply as Jesus. He spends his days driving a cab, spreading the gospel, and preparing the world for the kingdom of God. The next Messiah, his name is Inri. Uh, he is from Brasilia, Brazil. Uh, followers of Inri um, push their Messiah around on a rolling pedestal. Dozens of disciples, most of them women, live full time with, and he says he's celibate at 69 years old. I would question that. In his walled compound, which is protected with barbed wire and electrical fencing. So this Messiah needs a lot of protection, apparently. Henry takes his name from the initials that Pontius Pilate inscribed on Christ's cross, and his awakening came in 1979. And the fifth one that this reporter noted was Jesus Maitayoshi. He drives around atop a van in, in Tokyo, Japan. Jesus Maitayoshi delivers a fiery sermon as part of his campaign for a seat in the House of Counselors, instructing opponents to commit suicide and threatening hellfire upon transgressors. That's a political campaign for you right there, right? During two weeks of campaigning in 2016, he's run in many elections over the past two decades. He drove around Tokyo spreading his message. Many people ignored him, thank God. But he did garner 6,114 votes. This Jesus my to Yoshi. You see, when we talk about hearing God's voice or does God want to speak to us today, I think that's where a lot of the culture ends up leaning to. Um, this past week, uh, actually over the last couple of weeks, we had some trouble with the printer here at the church. So went to Staples to get a, a printer, had a, had a brother with me. We go, this, this one of the managers there helps us through the whole process. And for some of you guys, you know, I'm Pastor Bill, but when it comes to business transactions, I could be a little bit difficult. And at the end of the transaction, I literally looked at this guy and I said, you know what? i am be honest. You did a great job. And he kind of was like, okay. And I said, no, no, no. I'm telling you, I don't usually say that. <laughs> I said, you did a really good job. Well, we ended up getting the printer, yada, yada. This past week, I went back and you kind of, I don't know if this happens to you guys, but as you go in your daily lives, you begin to realize, you know, my life is not my own and God has a purpose and a plan. So I go, end up running to this guy again. He starts helping me with this thing. Somewhere along the line, he says, oh, you're from Florida. And I said, yeah, I'm originally from Florida. He goes, people in Florida seem to have a, a better mindset than here. And I said, interesting you say that. I said, you want to know maybe what that mindset, why it may be different? He said, sure. And I said, I'm going to say one word to you, one word to you, and I want you to tell me what comes to your mind first. I said, the Bible. And he goes, he goes, you're right. He said, all of a sudden, all these negative thoughts came into my mind. And I said, that's how it works. And we got to talking about the Lord. You see, when it comes to hearing God's voice, when it comes to Jesus or the Bible, Many of us have thoughts about these things that really aren't true, that aren't true. Maybe you're here and I, we're, we're going to talk about hearing God's voice and you think, that's nonsense. You know, if I can't hear it, if I can't feel it, if I can't smell it, you know, if I can't see it, it can't be true. Or maybe you're here and as I say hearing God's voice, you say, I hear his audible voice every day. Maybe you're on that extreme. 
This morning, we're going to look at God's word and see what does the Bible say? What, is it, what does God's word say about these things? And we're going to look at it in reference to a man who truly did hear from God. Who truly did hear from God. His name was Samuel. Can you guys say Samuel? If you have your Bibles, they should be open. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Um, We're going to look at this text and we're going to really focus in on verse 10. But I want you to get the whole context. So we're going to pick it up. 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 1. It says, Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord, it was rare in those days. Not many people were hearing from the Lord. There was no widespread revelation, verse 2, and it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could barely see, before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called, and he said, Samuel, and he answered, Here I am. Verse 5, so he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call you, Samuel. Lie down again. And Samuel went and laid down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he answered, and Eli said again, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Verse 7, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Verse 9, therefore Eli said to Samuel, go back to your bed, lie down, and it shall be if he calls you that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Verse 10, now the Lord came and stood and called as other times and said, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, speak for your servant hears. Now listen, first Samuel, this book, as we're moving through it, we see here now, and last week we looked at God saying to, through an unnamed prophet to Eli, those who honor God, God will honor. Now we see God honoring a man, honoring really a young man, Samuel, at this time, if you're taking note, you could jot it down, probably 12 years old. So God now is speaking to a 12-year-old. You know, one thing, let's get it out of the way right now, Um, how old you are or how long you've walked with the Lord really has little to do with being in a position for God to speak to you. Samuel was new at all of this, and yet the Lord wanted to speak to him. The verse we're going to really focus on is verse 10 of chapter 3. Now the Lord came and stood and called his other time Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, speak for your servant hears. See, the first thing we're going to see here, number one, if you're taking note, number one, is, is you have, if you want to hear from God, you have to realize you are heard of God. If you want to hear from God, you first have to realize that you are heard of God. If you have your pen, you could circle that word Samuel. That's what his name means. It means heard of God. Whatever you're going through this morning, wherever you're at, church, listen, you need to realize that who you are to God, you need to realize who you are to God and that he loves you and that he hears you. He hears your cries. He hears your heart. He hears your disappointments. He hears your frustrations. He hears you. His word is already going forth. He wants to answer. See, the first part of hearing from the Lord is to know who we are. Our little daughter, Selah, she is learning to talk, you know. And it's really interesting. For you guys that have had children, you know, they're kind of born. They're so cute. They roll around. Then they learn to walk. And I know some people think that's cuter, but it's actually less cute because now they can walk and get around and hurt themselves and break things and all that stuff. But as they learn to talk, it's very interesting because they're trying so hard to talk and yet you kind of don't know what they're saying. But you know who knows what they're usually saying? Their mother. (laughs) Their mother. Me, you know, goo goo gaga means goo goo gaga. That's what it means to me. But to her mother, it, it means like a paragraph, you know. You know. There's that 
that translation that takes place from the baby's mouth to the mother's ears. You know, when it comes to the Lord, church, listen, if you want to hear from the Lord, number one, you need to learn that you're heard of God. When you pray, God listens. God listens. Now, do we have an adversary that wants to convince us that God is too busy for you? That he doesn't hear you when you pray. That your prayers, they hit the, the ceiling and they bounce around and that's as far as they go. Of course, we have an adversary who wants to convince us of that. But it's just not true. Church, listen. God hears your prayers. And I say that because I want you to know when we talk about hearing God's voice or hearing from the Lord, you need to understand you do not need to do anything to activate the voice of God. The idea that in the age today that God isn't speaking or God doesn't want to lead his people is just not true. How many Christians I know, they're trying so hard, so, so, so hard to get God's favor towards them. When the truth of the matter is, God has turned his face towards you long ago and loved you. You know, for many of you, you probably have a cell phone. And when you get a cell phone, you know, you, ha you get the actual object, but you have to activate that phone. You have to put the code in and get it started and turn it on. And often we think that's how it is with the voice of God, but it's really not true. God's already speaking. For you note takers, you could jot it down. Psalm chapter 29 Psalm chapter 29, this is a Psalm of David. Psalm chapter 29, verse three, you'll see it on the screen. David says, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. Guys, if you remember all the way back to the book of Genesis, the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do that? It says that God said, let there be light. God said it. Before you and I ever were, God was already speaking. The voice of the Lord is over the waters Psalm 29, verse 3, the God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Verse 5, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Down to verse 7, the voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. Verse 8, the voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. Verse 9, the voice of the Lord is even interested in making the deer give birth. God's speaking, church. You have to realize that God hears you when you speak. And I think because we aren't coming to the word or we don't realize God's speaking and that he loves you just as you are, you don't have to earn it. What I see happen, and I, I like to call it uh, many Christians, in order to hear God's voice, I think they begin to practice ventrilo ventriloquism. You, ever, you know what that is, ventriloquism? Years ago, um, I was a counselor at a sleepaway Christian camp. Let me tell you, that's one of the hardest jobs in the world, okay? Hardest jobs. And the, the, there was an older man, he was the guy that ran the whole camp. It was a giant camp, probably 500 young people. And uh, he would get up there with this little, ven this little puppet he called Mikey, and he would talk about Jesus and... Honestly, the kids didn't like that much because it was kind of goofy, but I loved it. I thought, man, this is great. But he'd get up there and he'd be like, so Mikey, how's things going? He'd be like, well, you know, Jesus loves you and you would do this the whole time. I think when it comes to the Lord, I think many of us do that. I think because we want to hear from the Lord or maybe we want to hear what we want to hear from the Lord, we kind of say, well, so-and-so, you should do this. And I think that can happen in the body of Christ when we don't realize, number one, that God wants to, he, he already hears you and his voice is already going forth. It's already going forth. I remember this story. Her name is Jessica Hahn. She was the former church secretary who committed immoral acts with uh, Jim Baker. I don't know how many of you guys are old enough to remember this. The former host of the PTL club and later brought down the PTL empire. Uh, she said following her affair with uh, Jim Baker that God gave her real peace about granting an interview to Playboy magazine and posing for topless pictures. In a September news article, uh, they reported that she still considers herself a Christian, but she goes to God one-on-one, -on -one, not through any uh, church organization. You see, we cannot take hearing from God for granted or belittle his word in any way. The enemy wants to do that to you and I. He wants to do that. He wants to turn it into something uh, that it truly is not. John Wesley, in his book, 
why Christians sin, he says this, do not hastily ascribe things to God. Do not easily suppose dreams, voices, impressions, visions, or revelations to be from God. He said, they may be from him. They may be from nature, he said, or they may be from the devil. <laughs> be careful, church, in this area. Be careful. It's important we don't get lost in these things. You see, this first principle is you have to know you're heard of God. I, I think most believers that struggle with this, and it's not okay, it ends up creating confusion, especially for newer Christians, because then they, you know, they're kind of looking for God in the New York Times crossword puzzle type of thing as well. But, but I think it all starts with them not realizing there's nothing you could do to get any more of God's attention. He already hears you just as you are, and he loves you just as you are. And that's that first principle. But the second one, back to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 10, God said to him, Samuel, Samuel, and this is what Samuel answered. If you want to hear from God, he said, speak for your servant hears. The second thing we're going to look at is this idea of speaking. If you have your pen, you could circle it. In the Hebrew, it's the Hebrew word debar, and it means to speak, to bring order. You see, when God speaks, it will not bring chaos and confusion, but it will certainly align with the word of God, and it will bring blessing and order to your life. I'm telling you, whatever it is, it will do that. You will see that happen in your life. If you're taking note, it's the second principle here in terms of hearing from God. You know, hearing from God comes from realizing how we communicate with him. It's number two. Guys, listen, we speak to God through prayer. This is very important, church. While God speaks to us through the still, small voice of his word. God speaks to us through the still, small voice of his word. Hebrews chapter one, for you note takers, jot this down and catch this. This is the word of the Lord. This is sound doctrine. You know, I know how many want to be Bible students or know the word, but the Bible, it's, it's intelligent. Hebrews chapter one, verse one, it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. So the author of Hebrews says, in time past, God spoke to us through the prophets. Samuel was a prophet. Every time David or the following kings will hear from God, it will be through the prophet. Even King David will hear from God through the prophet. And the author of Hebrews says, that's how God used to speak. Verse two, he says, has in these last days spoken to us by what? His son, his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, to whom also he made the worlds. So the author of Hebrews says, God used to speak through the prophets. Samuel was a prophet, Isaiah, Ezekiel. But now he speaks to us by his son. Well, tell me more. What does the Bible talk about? Jesus, you know, he was on this earth for, for 33 years with the disciples, but now he's in heaven. How does that apply to me? Listen, note takers, jot it down. John chapter one, John chapter one, verse one. How many of you guys, if you just pay attention to this, you don't have to come to the Jehovah Witness seminar. No, I'm just kidding. John chapter one, verse one, it says, in the beginning was what? The word. The word. And the word was with God and the word was God. So wait a second. The word is God. Okay. Who is this word? Who is this God? John chapter one, a few verses down, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now I know no one here is Sherlock Holmes, but I think we can connect the dots. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Guys, listen, God used to speak through the prophets. Now he speaks through his son. His son is the word. The word is Jesus Christ. Guys, listen, the word is Jesus Christ. If, if Jesus was here right now, sitting with us, speaking to us, do you know what he would share with us? Exactly what the word says. Jesus is the word. This book is not the Encyclopedia Britannica. This book is not war and peace. This book is the divine wisdom and knowledge and breath of God. 
This is the word. Church, we speak to God through prayer while God speak to us through the still, small voice of his word. You know, I think much of hearing from God has to do with us sitting still long enough before his word and listening. Sitting still long enough before his word and listening. Keep your finger there in 1 Samuel. I want you to turn to the book of 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. What an amazing area of scripture. This is a prophet of God. This is Elijah. Many of you may be familiar with this. And Elijah hears from God. He hears God's voice. And it's amazing the circumstances. Elijah had just challenged these false prophets of Baal. Can I say this, church? As you grow in your walk with the Lord, there should be a challenge in your heart to the false gods of this world today. You know, we should not be content as children of God to see what's happening in the world around us. But we should be, as Jesus said, salt and light. We should be, God should be using us to put light on darkness and to bring people out of darkness into the light by the grace of God. But Elijah had just challenged these prophets of Baal. God gave him a great victory with the fire from heaven. Uh, and we pick it up, 1 Kings chapter 19. It says, And Ahab told Je Jezebel, Ahab at the time was the king of Israel, a bad king. His wife Jezebel, I mean, how many people do you know named Jezebel? Let's be honest. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Verse 2, Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, so let the gods do to me and more also. If I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time, she says to him, sweet words from a sweet woman. Verse three, and when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. I mean, you get it, right? The prophet Elijah is scared out of his mind. And he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And look what he says. And he prayed that he might die. And said, it is enough now, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. I love this area of scripture. You know, this is the prophet of Elijah. Guys, this is a man that God used to literally challenge the nation of Israel. And said, you are serving false gods? They said, really? They said, these false gods are powerful. And he challenged all of the prophets of Baal to see whose God was real. And God gave him the victory. This man had the guts to challenge an entire nation. But one woman defrailed it all. He was petrified of Jezebel. The Bible clearly indicates. Ran for his life. Runs in fear. And says to the Lord, Lord, just take my life. You know, church, you could be following the Lord, you could be doing the right thing, and there could be discouragement. There could be difficulty. There really, truly can, to the point where you're like, Lord, I don't know if I could do it anymore. But just keep talking to the Lord, because he'll, he'll talk you through it. Look what happens, verse 5. Then as he lay and he slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. The Lord's so good. Made him some cake. So he ate and drank and lay down again, went back to sleep. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. Verse 8, so he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights, as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Verse 9, and there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And God said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? I love this. You know, Mount Horeb, for you Bible students, guys, this is the place where Moses met with God in the burning bush, where the bush was burning, but it wasn't consumed. That picture of Israel, though Israel was in bondage, they were slaves of Egypt. They were burning, but they were not consumed. That's the church. That's you. You might be here today and walked with the Lord for 10, 20, 30 years, and you would agree with me. You would say, I don't know how I've made it. I'm a burning bush. I've been burning. Difficulties have happened. Trials have taken place, but I'm not consumed. God is able. God is not bound 
by your ability or even man's ability. And the things God will do in your life, man won't be able to really explain. But he's there now on Mount Horeb. This angel got him there. And God says to Elijah, what are you doing in this cave? What are you doing here? You know, as we talk about hearing from the Lord, and we're talking about the real voice of God, I want to tell you this. Often what we call the voice of God, I never see God saying those things in the Bible. Often when we hear the voice of God, it's this. What are you doing here? Usually when people say, God spoke to me, it's not that. It's not, God spoke to me. He said, I'm in sin and I need to humble my heart. Usually that's not what they say God said. But when you look in the Bible, it's usually when, when Jesus spoke to Peter, he said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You know, you're doing the wrong thing. Sometimes the Lord is to tell us these things. And he says to Elijah here, what are you doing here? He says, why are you hiding out? Why are you in this place of discouragement and depression? And I would say this, I think the Lord is saying the heart of the matter with Elijah, why are you in the cave of self-pity? Church, I'm telling you, self-pity won't get you anywhere. The, the, he's gone to be with the Lord. His name is F.B. Meyer. In one of his books, he speaks about self-pity and he says self-pity is the most grievous of all sins. Because what it says to the Lord, it says, Lord, I don't like what you're doing in my life. It says, you know, self-pity is nothing more, church, than rebellion. Although the Bible says that God loves you, that he's good, that he's light, that he's your father, self-pity says to the Lord, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I don't relate to it. And you might say, oh, that's where I'm at. Elijah was there too, church. Elijah was there. And let's see what happened next. So the Lord said, what are you doing there? Verse 10. So Elijah said, he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, like all of us. He says, I am on fire for you. I'm on fire. I love Jesus. Jesus is looking at him like, you're in a cave in Horeb, scared of a woman. Wow, you sure look like you're really on fire, you know. That's what he says, though, like many of us. For the children of Israel, he says, have forsaken you. Next, he says, I'm on fire for you. It's their fault. They're the ones not doing the right thing. It's not me, Lord. The children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. He said, I alone am left. And, I, and they seek to take my life. Boy, Elijah is in the cave of self-pity, man. Verse 11, then he said, God said to him, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, look at this church. The Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But I love this. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord, he wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And once again, suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And then if you fast forward to verse 15, God will tell him, then the Lord said to him, go return on your way. Basically, God said to Elijah, this is who I am. This is how I speak. And he basically says, stay the course. <laughs> he says, go return on your way. You see, I think for Elijah, he had these expectations because God had done legitimately big things in his life. And Elijah may have expected God to work in big ways. He's meeting with God in Horeb, the mountain of God. This is where Moses met with God. And if you can recall some of the ways that God worked in Moses's life, Elijah may have assumed, well, you worked this way in Moses's life. So this is what I'm expecting in my life. You know, Ahab's after him. Jezebel's after him. Maybe he thought, God, you're going to have an earthquake. The ground's going to part and Ahab's going to be sucked in, killed forever, right? Jezebel, she's after me. You're going to send lightning from heaven and zap her for good. Be done with my problems. You're going to deal with them that way. In church, I believe this is one reason why we do get depressed. I think what happens is the Lord doesn't do for us what we think he should do for us, or he doesn't do it the way we think he should. It's not, 
as big or as exciting or we're not experiencing things the way we once experienced them. And God said to Elijah, he said, I'm not in the wind. I'm not in the earthquake. I'm not in the fire. He said, I'm in the still small voice, whispering my will and my word into your heart, leading you one step at a time, one day at a time. Church, listen, God is speaking, but how he speaks He's communicated in his word. This is how he wants to speak to us. You see, Elijah had to learn that God was not necessarily going to work in the way, the time, and the manner that he recommended. How many of you guys have experienced that? That God's not going to do it probably the way you want him to. He's probably not going to fall in line with you. Church, listen, take a step back for a moment. When it comes to hearing from the Lord, I want you to catch this. You may be panicking legitimately in life. There may be a situation that is causing you to panic in a situation. But church, God is not panicking. God is not going, I don't know what I'm going to do here. I'm out of options. I'm not sure how to fix this. That's not God. That's you. And God now comes into the equation and he's trying to get your attention He's trying to, in his, with a still small voice through his word, whisper to your heart. But often we're so panicked and so, you know, like a deer in the headlights or like a chicken with its head cut off. The Lord's speaking and we're going, the Lord's not speaking to me. And the Lord's going, shh, sit down. Let me talk to you for a minute. No, oh, that's not the Lord. <laughs> the Lord's saying, shh, calm down. I'm in charge. I'm controlling it. You're going to be fine. You see, God will speak to you. He will direct you through a still small voice. That's what he does, church. That's what he does. He loves to do that. It's not hard for him. It's not hard for him. We're almost through. Back to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 10. This verse we're looking at. God said to Samuel, 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 that means heard of God. If you want to hear from the Lord, first you have to realize God hears you because of Jesus, because of the blood. Samuel asked her, answered and said, speak for your servant hears. You want to hear from the Lord? Every morning, develop this habit. Go before the Lord and say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. You see, it's number three in terms of God speaking to you. It's God speaks to those willing to respond. He speaks to those that are servants, that have the posture of a servant. You know, have you ever been to a restaurant? You sit down, you're, you're real hungry, you open the menu, you've got it, and the waiter or the waitress comes over, and it's kind of like they're coming to do you a favor. You ever been there? Well, you, you, you're kind of there, you're ready to eat, and they kind of come over, yeah, hi, welcome to whatever this place is called, you know? You're like, you have any specials? Uh, hold on, you know? And they go, they get their little paper, and they're like, well, we have... And uh, they're like, excuse me one second. You know, they're kind of on their phone. They come back. And you're kind of like, wow, this is great service. You know, <laughs> I've never experienced anything this wonderful before. No, you're not saying that. That's me in the booth next to you. But guys, listen, it's the same with the Lord. We say, Lord, I want you to speak to me and tell me what I want you to hear. Um, hold on one second, Lord. You know, we're <laughs> like, oh, I just got a Facebook like. Let me see. Okay. Whatever, Lord, you got 30 seconds, go. And the Lord's like, okay. You see, Samuel said, speak, Lord, your servant hears. You see, God speaks to servants. He speaks to those that basically are willing to respond to him. And often I find that the Lord speaks to us about little things in our lives. Little things. Little things. You see, hearing from God has much to do with your perspective on yourself in relation to God. Hearing from God has a lot to do with your perspective on yourself in relation to God. You know, if, if you see yourself as kind of like this equal with God, like, Lord, I'm going to tell you what to do. You tell me what to do, but I'm probably going to tell you what to do more often. Um, I'm just going to tell you, that's probably not going to work with the Lord. Because he is God. We just think we are sometimes. He's God. You see, servants hear the voice of their master. Sheep 
hear the voice of their shepherd. And sons and daughters listen to the voice of their father. God speaks to servants. The voice of the Lord is, is coming to those that are saying, speak, Lord, your servant. And the last principle we're going to see here this morning, Samuel said, speak, Lord, your servant hears, listens. I believe this is probably the most important of all of the principles in terms of the voice of God or hearing God's voice. If you're taking notice, number four, it's God speaks to those who listen. God speaks to those who listen. You see, I don't think we understand how important listening is to God. I don't think we understand how important it is to our walk with the Lord that we learn to listen to him. And I think one of the challenges of listening to God, I think one of the greatest challenges is that God takes his time. Is God is not in a rush. I, I love this story. It's in a book by Tim LaHaye called How to Study the Bible for Yourself. He was writing about how God is, is sure to guide you. Like, I'm not sure how many of us realize this, but God has more skin in the game when it comes to our life than we do. <laughs> God is sure to guide us. And British pastor Frank W. Borham recounted a time when a minister visited his home in New Zealand. Being young and inexperienced, Borham sought the counsel of his guest. He said that one morning they were sitting on the porch looking out over the golden plains to the purple sunlit mountains. He asked the minister, can a man be sure that in the hour of perplexity he will be rightly led by God? Can he feel secure against making a false step? And the pastor said, I'm certain of it, exclaimed the minister, if he will but give God time. As long as you live, remember that, give God. God time. This is a tough one because we don't live in a, in a world that time is something we value much of anymore. But that's it. The Lord, he, he wants to speak to you daily, but we have to give him time. We have to be willing to listen. See, listening is so important to the Lord. A couple verses to jot down. Mark chapter 4, verse 24 through 25 Jesus talked about listening. Mark 4, 24 through 25, it says, Then Jesus said to them, Take heed what you hear. What you hear. You know, the way you take in the word is very important. You know, Paul said to Timothy, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman who doesn't have to be ashamed, who rightly divides the word of truth. Jesus said, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, basically to you who hear the word, who hear the truth of God, who, who present yourself to God as a servant and say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. To you who hear, more will be given. You see, that, that's, how, that's one of the qualifications the Lord has for those that he wants to really use. You have to be hearers. You have to hear the word. You have to hear it. Obviously, Jesus will go on to say, don't just be hearers of the word, but also be doers of it. But this is the thing. We can talk about doing things for God, but if we're not hearing from God, you're actually not doing things for God. You know what you're doing? Things. That's what you're doing. Before you do things for God, you have to hear from the Lord. You have to have relationship with God. That, the posture of a servant. For whoever has, verse 25, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. You see, when we're not able to hear from the Lord, or maybe we heard from the Lord, but now we're kind of doing our own thing, what the Lord will do is he'll say, oh my gosh, my servant is no longer my servant. Now my servant is acting like my master. What the Lord will do is he will take the responsibilities that he stewarded to you, and he will give them to someone else who hears and in this text, it could be a 12-year-old, Samuel. God is going to take from this professional minister, Eli, his responsibilities, and he's going to give them to someone who would listen to him, which in the text happens to be a 12-year-old, Samuel. And that's how the Lord works. We have to be hearers of the word. We have to be hearers. Now listen, we're almost through. But I want to kind of wrap this up with this. Such an important thing. 
I believe that in these days, God wants to speak to his people. I believe God wants you to go day by day, walking with him and hearing from him. Walking with him and hearing from him. You know, this is a principle in my own family with my own children. I try to communicate. I love it. I remember the last time we had this discussion with the kids. I remember my son Luke going, you know, dad, yesterday I really sat there and I tried to hear, but I couldn't hear him talking. I don't know. Was I doing something wrong? And I just laughed. It was so great. You know, I was like, you know, be like Samuel. Wait on the Lord. Read the word. Read the word. But guys, listen, the question isn't, as we wrap this up, is God speaking? I I hope you're catching that. The question isn't, is God speaking today? That's not the question. The question is, are you listening? That's the question. The question isn't, does God care about my life? Does God want to lead my life? I'm telling you right now, from the word of God, God has already proven you through his son, Jesus Christ, death on the cross, He wants to lead your life. Church, listen, God has more skin in the game in your life than you do. He has the skin of his only begotten son to purchase and see your life used for his glory. The question is, isn't is God speaking? The question is, are you listening? And I want to ask you this as we wrap things up. What would you do if like Samuel, God actually spoke to you? We love to talk about it. But what would you actually do? I think some here might say, oh, I'd start that ministry. We'd say, I'd preach from that pulpit. We'd say, I'd take that position as pastor. (laughs) That's not how it works, guys. That's not how it works. What if God says in reality when he spoke to you, because I find that in reality God speaks to us most about the little things in our life. What if God spoke to you and said, hey, I want you to get a job. What if God said that? That's not the Lord. (laughs) What if God said to you, I want you to pay your bills. I want you to be responsible with the unrighteous mammon. (laughs) Then I'll give you true riches. That's what he already said in his word. What if he said, I want you to love your wife. You go, that's definitely not the Lord. (laughs) What if he said, I want you to respect your husband. The women are like, blasphemy. (laughs) What if he said, I want you to rejoice in your singleness. I want you to rejoice. What if he said, I want you to be faithful in prayer. What if he said to you, I want you to share the gospel in your everyday activities. Not just when you go on missions things, but in your actual life with your neighbors. Oh, the Lord would never tell me to do that. Oh yes, that's actually what he's saying. What if he said, oh, how I long to meet with you with the Bible open to speak to your heart. What if he said that to you? What if he said to you in a difficult time, I want you to stay the course. I want you to follow me. I want you to let your roots grow down deep. I want you to be a vessel of honor. I want to teach you to bear much fruit. What if God said that to you? See, the question isn't, is God speaking? The question truly is, church, are are we listening? I believe that in the midst of this culture that we live in, God is speaking. His word is still going out. I believe Satan is doing everything he can to drown out the voice of God, the gospel, the the life that the Lord has for you and I. But the question we have to ask ourselves this morning is, are we willing to listen? Because what will happen in your life, in my life, if we stop, church, listen, if we slow down, if we begin to value Actually, truly listening to the Lord. What would happen? Revelation 3 verse 20. You'll see it on the screen. You want to know the answers. They're always in the back of the book, church. It's the truth. 
Revelation 3 verse 20, Jesus is saying this to the church. He's actually saying this to his people. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He said, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will dine with him and he with me. See, what will happen if you and I slow down long enough to listen to the voice of the Lord, to be a servant, to like Samuel say, Lord, speak. I'm your servant and I'm listening. What will happen? Jesus said, I will come into him. He said, there will be a peace that surpasses all understanding that will rest upon your life simply because I'm there, because you're listening. And the second thing, and it's probably my favorite, he says, I will dine with him and he with me. What does that mean? He said, I'll have dinner at your house and you can come over and have dinner at my house. And I mean that. I am not trying to, to belittle that or make God less. I'm saying when you begin to legitimately listen to the Lord, the relationship you have with God goes to a different level. It becomes more personal. God says, when am I on the schedule to come have dinner at your house? I'm looking forward to it. He says, let's make sure we set something up for you to come over my house and sit with me. I want to feed you too. The relationship becomes more personal, more real, more intimate. And boy, is God a good cook, let me tell you. He is. Church, listen, Jesus is calling you close today. Hearing God's voice, it doesn't have to be a mystery. Simple stuff. Samuel means heard of God. You have to realize God hears your prayers, even today. You could be driving on the, the highway, riding your motorcycle, taking a jog, sitting in front of the television, watching a sporting event, saying, Lord, you know, what I just saw there, that bothers me. God's, God's not like, you know, you're not in church. I don't hear those prayers. I'm sorry. Nope. You're heard of God. You're heard of God. God's already speaking, guys. You don't have to do anything special to get God to speak. He's already speaking. Are you a servant? Is that your posture? Are you listening and that last thing, are you, are you listening to the Lord? Lord, would you speak to me? Father, we do today. Lord, thank you for your word.